What's happening, everybody? It's the Cassius Morris Show. Thank you for tuning in for a very special episode. Today marks a milestone for the podcast, episode number 200. I just wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you to everybody who has watched one of the videos, subscribed, liked, commented. There's a ton of different ways to access this show, and people have been doing all of them, so I greatly appreciate you guys. And for episode 200, I wanted to bring something special None other than the one and only Carlos Bustamante, best known for his work currently on Entertainment Tonight Canada, and of course his legendary 16 year run on YTV's The Zone. Welcome back to The Zone, ladies and gentlemen. The best after school programming show that I've ever seen in between cartoons, and Carlos was clearly a huge influence on me. I mean, 16 years on YTV, I'm 22, do the math. Anybody that grew up in Canada, around this time period, knows Carlos, they know the zone on YTV, and they know the legacy that this guy has here in Canada. So it's a massive thing, and I thought it was really special to get him on for episode 200 of the podcast. So thank you, Carlos, for coming on the show. Shout out to ET Canada for also helping arrange this. I appreciate you guys, and I hope you guys enjoy this interview. We talked a lot about Carlos's background, his personal interests, things about him. People know him as a host, but people don't know exactly who he is, what he likes, what he likes to do in his spare time, how he feels about the jobs that he's done. And that's really what this interview provides. You get to go inside Carlos's head, find out dimensions of him that you will not find elsewhere. If you find yourself enjoying this episode, please hit that subscribe button, be it on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and definitely hit that like button or leave a review on your favorite audio platform. So without further ado, let's get into my exclusive interview with the one and only Carlos Bustamante. Carlos Bustamante, thank you for joining me on the Cassius Morris Show. Hey, man, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is very cool. 100%. Very cool that you took the time. Now, you know, you're a fascinating guy to me because everybody seems to know you, especially out here in Canada, but I feel like people don't really know a whole lot about you personally and about your history. So that's really why I wanted to do this today. I wanted to get into Carlos and sort of talk about how you came into all of this. So, you know, at risk of sort of sounding like I'm asking a stock question, that's the reasoning. Uh, how sure. did this start for you, man? How'd you get into all this? It's pretty straightforward, man. I was, um, I was in theater school here in Toronto. I was going to a place called the Randolph Academy. It's called the Randolph College for Performing Arts now. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, YTV was looking for a co-host for Sugar, for Stephanie Beard, um, Suge, my co-host, my partner in crime. And uh, yeah, I auditioned at school and I got a callback audition and I had a meeting and then I was in. And that was it. I, start, was I it. graduated school. Yeah, we had our um, graduation ceremony, I want to say like on the Sunday and I started work on the Monday. So I was like, I was right in. Wow. So, so you were always involved in performance arts. You were doing dance from a young age. And was, was there ever acting in theater or was it just sort of dance stuff? It was mostly dance stuff. I think we, we did a little bit of, um, we, by, by we, I mean like the group I was with. Remember we did a little bit of like um, theater training, but also that it channeled back into our dance performance. Mm. And then uh, when I went to Randall, I mean, I had done like, drama in school that sort of thing like choreographing the school play and stuff like that yeah um but when i'd gotten into uh randolph that's when i was like oh this is this is i mean i want to do this i got in as a dancer because you had to do like one of three well they wanted you to do two of three things very well singing acting or dancing and my singing and acting was not there uh but the dancing was and so it was enough so that they let me into the school. I got into the school and from there, I just kind of like really loved it. Just enjoyed being part of the whole scene. I uh, enjoyed the work of it. And um, it was a great place to be for that time. Definitely. So, so when you first started that, was, were you sort of leading towards a dance career? Because I know you did some professional work in dance or was it just like, hey, I need one of the triple threats to get in. I'm gonna go with this and see what happens. Um, yeah, it was sort of like, you know, you got to figure out what you're going to do after high school. Yeah. And so I had applied to a bunch of the universities and I applied to Randolph Academy as well. And when I went to the Randolph, when I went to their sort of like, 
I guess like orientation day or whatever it was. Um, I really dug their vibe. Also, Gregory Hines, who was my hero growing up. I don't know if you know who Gregory Hines yeah, uh, is. Yes. So like, as far as tap, that's why I was a tap dancer growing up. Like that was my main mm-hmm. thing. And as far as tap dancers go, there's always like, basically like one person for a generation. Yeah. And so like 80s, 90s, I want to say when I was in it growing up, uh, it was Gregory Hines. And so he was my guy and he was there and he was friends with the, with the owner of the school. And he was like, that, I was like, wait, what? That's amazing. <laughs> it's like, he's involved. And so that was kind of it. That was the clincher for me that made me go like, Oh, I'm going to go here. Um, yeah. And I, I guess I wanted to do dancing professionally. There wasn't anything specifically pointed. It wasn't like, it's gotta be this particular thing or that particular thing. I right. just love doing the work. Right. So um, whether it was going to be musical theater stuff or if it was going to be dancing in videos or if it was going to be dancing on a cruise ship or dancing for whatever, I was like, I'm going to do that. And I want to try doing, I want to try doing this other stuff too. Cause I feel like I've got a knack for it as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it basically, that's how it was when I was that during that period of my life, it was like, if, if it's interesting to me and I feel like I can do it, I'm going to go, I'm going to give it a shot. And that's kind of mm-hmm. what that audition was for YTV. It was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I grew up watching YTV. I remember right. PJ Phil. I, I loved PJ Phil when I was a kid. Um, and just like you, much music and all that stuff. For sure. Um, and so, yeah, when the audition came around, I was like, okay, well, this is a thing I can probably do. Yeah. And, and that would make sense. So w- how advanced was sort of being an on-air host of that sort at that time? Like, was there a lot of the much music stuff? I, I guess, was Strombo going? I mean, what was your main influence in terms of an yes. on-air host? I just loved late night shows. Yeah. I love late night shows. Conan O'Brien. O'Brien? Like, the yeah, yeah, the top at that time for me, for sure. Letterman? It was like goofy and weird. Letterman, yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. That's like that lineage, right? Where it was like, I don't know, things, well, everything felt a little off kilter, right? And that was on purpose by design. So that was basically it. And I, I admired like uh, George Stromvelopoulos, still do. I still absolutely do. Same here. Um, uh, loved Sukian. And again, like it was that thing of like, everything's off kilter by design. Like everything's supposed to be a mm-hmm. bit different. That's kind of what I loved about our, um, the media landscape in Canada growing up when I was a kid in the 90s, it was like, Everything that that seemed a little bit off from what was going on, I guess, in the U.S. Um, And again, like it was by design. Everything felt a little bit weird. Everything felt a little bit different. And that was maybe it was um, based on resources that things had to be done a particular way. Hmm. But I loved that. So, you know, those were big. Those were big influences for me. That, that's a good point, too, because it, it, it made a very unique style and something that Canadians could say, hey, this is our own. And, and it is sometimes a little quirky and fun, but that is the appeal of it. And that's the design of it. So that being said, were, were you well prepared in that sense for a gig where you're going to be going on? And because you're doing so much more than hosting um, when you were doing the YTV stuff. I mean, you were doing audience challenges. So were you well suited for such a uh, diverse hosting job by seeing that? I mean, I guess so. Mm-hmm. I guess I guess right. I was. I felt like I was. When I was in school, we did a lot of, uh, there was a wide variety of things that we had to do. A lot right. of challenges to overcome and a lot of different experiences as far as performing goes. So I felt like by the time I got to that audition, when I was in that first audition, everything that kind of threw at me, because it was an individual thing. Like, you know, you go in one at a time and you basically do a bunch of improv stuff. Right. Everything they threw at us, I was like, oh, I'm doing this. Like, I'm doing mm-hmm. this already. I can do this. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was a combination, too, of, like, of the training I'd had the, the past two years. And also just, like, the way I was brought up um, dancing in the dance community. I guess it was just a thing of, like, my teacher when I was growing up, there was no challenge that you could not overcome. Like, right. there was no such thing as something that you couldn't, you know, you got to give everything a shot. So, yeah, that's kind of where it was at. And as, as far as like being prepared to do kind of everything, it was a mixture of like the training that I had and also just a great environment where mm-hmm. you're allowed to learn as you go along, like you're supposed to learn as you go along. And that was kind of part of the thing. It was like, it's okay if they see you learning. Like okay. that's, part of, that's part of it because they're learning too. 
So, hmm. so it yeah. wasn't like a corporate, like super tight uh, environment at YTV. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. I guess you yeah. couldn't really pull it off that well if you wanted to have a sort of very fun programming and, and have that translate on air. I guess you couldn't have a super strict behind the scenes. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you could. That just wasn't my experience at the time. Okay. There, was, there was certainly um, things about it that were strict. Like, yeah. um, I mean, just in terms of how we had to operate and sort of our, um, that's what I'm looking for here. Uh, the way that we presented ourselves, whether on camera mm. and off, like that sort of mm. thing. We, you know, you got to represent the company well. Um, but as far as being creative goes, like we would come up with just wacky stuff that we wanted to do and that we just thought was fun. And our EP would go, okay, that works. So I don't think that works. Modify it or whatever. And um, and then that's, that was it. Then we just go. It's funny because I was looking back. People will often send me like, you know, like clips, old clips of stuff. And I remember, I remember um, when I first started, the mixture of feeling prepared and not feeling prepared. Hmm. And so you just kind of get through things. It's it's like, it's live and also live to tape. It depends on, on what we were doing at the whatever period of time. And so there's no like going back and changing things and no. editing it, whatever, whatever. Sometimes you can, you can do a take again and we got to do a take again because of whatever, but it's the full two minutes, three minutes, whatever you're going to do live. Um, or live to tape. Hmm. And uh, looking back now, it's funny because you can see how green, like I can see how green I was and how like, I can see the wheels turning in my head right. of like, I got to get from point A to B to C. And that obviously still happens now, but you know, you mm. hope after years and years, there's a refinement, right? Well, for sure. And, and when you're looking at that, you're also having a different experience because you're, you're sort of remembering the process of what went into it. You're not exactly just taking, taking that in. Is that most of what you remember the process of, of most of these things, or was that more so in the beginning? Uh, I remember it. Well, I don't remember a lot of it. Like that's mm. the thing too. It was a long okay. time ago. And, and also we, there was so much output. Yeah. It was like, um, you know, you think of it was like about 15 minutes of TV a day, five days a week, which might not mm. sound like a lot, but we were doing everything. Pardon me. We were doing, I just made a sandwich. We were doing everything like the morning of. So right. it's like, we're from blank slate to put it on air, it was like morning of, we get in, we're gonna do, we're gonna try and make a thing. What props do we need? Do we need to make anything? Do we need to call on any, any favors from someone else in the building? Do we need to, whatever. That goes up first thing in the morning, then we start recording. Um, so you know, those are the things I remember. But again, like, I don't remember a lot of, people will say, hey, you remember when you did this thing? I'm like, no. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I totally right. don't because there was because so was many of, there were so many and it yeah. was like you know some of them were really fun some of them are actually very very memorable i think they're memorable maybe maybe this is to your point maybe this is what the question is but like some of them are memorable because of the process right, right. like who are you doing it with yeah. what do you have to do to make this thing work and mm -hmm. uh you know maybe it's funnier in your mind and in your memory than it actually was on the day on air but those are the ones that i remember best yeah, that, that completely makes sense because it's, I mean, you, again, you guys were pushed so much out of the element of a regular show host. Was there anything that you sort of was too out of your element for the air or you felt like, boy, this really tested me today? Or was it always just, okay, another thing coming? It's kind of like just, okay, another thing coming, yeah. Yeah. you know? Um, I don't know that we did anything that was, I mean, everything that we wanted that, that might have been challenging to do, we were, we were part of creating. Like it was right. us saying we want to make this thing. Very hands-on, so, it sounds like. Oh, absolutely. It was mm -hmm. like, um, it really was also like a, a very educational thing. It was like being in another school, right? Mm. Because we learned how to, I can, I can speak for myself, I can speak for Sugar at this, at this point, I think too. Um, we were learning how to do certain technical things. We were learning how to mm. work with green screen. We were learning how to do, I mean, she was already a voiceover artist by that point. So I was learning how to do voiceover stuff. Um, Everything, again, like it was an education. And so as we were learning, like I said before, and growing and things were getting better, I think. For sure. Um, you mentioned part of how part of the strictness potentially, or I guess just some of the guidelines that were more needed to follow were your, your off-air 
uh, how you conduct yourself. I'm curious, was that more, was that easier to manage before social media was more prevalent before Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram was a huge thing? Or do you think it's harder now for people in a position such as yours, especially when they're younger? Probably, hmm. probably like we didn't do anything like ridiculously crazy. I was also right. kind of raised that way too. Like there's, Again, like when I was younger, there was sort of a responsibility on me that I had as I was growing up in the dance community, in my community, to maintain um, levels of professionalism, you know, okay. from when I was like eight years old, nine years old. So that stuff wasn't new. So it wasn't mm. like a hugely challenging thing. Um, but that being said, I think that, uh, I think nowadays it is harder. Um, yeah. you, you see it all the time. It's kind of like, it's something that's brought up constantly. And, and older actors will say it a lot of the time too, or, hmm. where they, they'll say, you know, I, I'm so glad this wasn't around 20 years ago so people couldn't see my mistakes sort of thing. Like that's what they'll right. always say. Um, or even so they couldn't, so they can't see my good times. Like the, um, I can't remember who it was that I, I remember seeing an interview with recently. It was, it was, it was a rock star mm -hmm. who basically said like, what's the point of being a rock star now? Right. <laughs> right. Because I've heard actors say that too. And actors will say that too. And I, I guess that's, that's sort of like, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It just depends on the person, obviously. Mm. Right. Like um, people can still enjoy themselves in all sorts of scenarios, but if you just, it just isn't the same as it was 20, 30 years ago. You just can't be, I guess, as free as you could have been back then. Right. But I, I guess at the same token, you're sort of saying, I never really had anything to hide. I was focused on my career. So maybe it wasn't as big of an issue for you personally. Would that be fair to say? It wasn't even that. I was just a nerd. I was, just, a I was just such a, I was just such a huge nerd, man. <laughs> like I spent so much time just like me and my roommate uh, or me and my brother, because he was also my roommate too. Like just playing Xbox, playing mm -hmm. PlayStation, like just hanging out. And we would go, we'd go out for sure. Like we'd go have a good time, but sure. like, the life for me wasn't, I wasn't striving for something that I wasn't. Like I mm. grew up kind of that way. I was like, I was, I was, a, you know, I was always a nerd. So like being in and, and not, you know, getting in trouble or whatever was easy because it just wasn't something I did. So it wasn't anything about being necessarily really focused on my career. If someone said to me, you know, you can't, or, or we would like you, we would like it if you didn't, you know, represent us badly off camera, I don't think that would be hard for me to do. Right. Because it's kind of the way I've always been, I suppose. That, that makes sense for sure. I, I know you're a big Star Wars fan. What, real quick, what's your favorite Star Wars film? Is it one of the prequels or one of the originals? No, it's Empire. I know that's, oh. the, that's the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the, <laughs> yeah, but it's, but it's Empire. <laughs> hey, man, you got to be honest about it, right? About. Hard to top yeah. that. It, it definitely is. So, Thinking about your transition from your past work to your more current work, it's it's a beautiful evolution. I mean, to see where somebody can oh, start and to where absolutely to see where they can go. Um, I'm curious, was it a difficult transition in some ways for you to be the the funny, silly guy on the air that sort of with irreverent humor um, to a serious journalist, or was that easier given mm -hmm. the fact that it's sort of a sister? Is it the sister network, and you were also on both shows, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was there was a time, my first year there, mm -hmm. my first year here, I should say, uh, where I was doing both, right. um, pretty extensively. Uh, I don't know that it was hard. Again, it's I think it's part of that thing of like, it, if it's coming my way, I'm just gonna try it. Right. Like if it's coming my way, I'm just gonna do it. So, I had loved doing what I was doing. I at YTV, one of the things I wanted to do was more interviews. I was like, I want to do more interviews. Mm -hmm. I love, I love doing the fun stuff and I love playing games and I love that style of interview, but like, I would love to just actually be able to sit down with someone and talk about what they're doing, like talk about their craft or talk about their product or whatever it is um, for more than like, you know, the, the three minutes or two minutes that we're going to be doing this segment. And right. then here's, here's a game and then here's some flashcards and here's a thing. And then you got to go by like guests would come in and they would say, this is one of the most unique experiences I've ever had. It was a lot of fun. Mm. But for me, I also was looking for, just something a little bit different. And so this is great because this provides that. I do this, I do it every single day. Yeah. It is every day, which is amazing to me. It's insane. Um, it's insane. It's right, like the idea that you can just do a thing that you like doing. Yeah, I, I come down here and this is already set up and we just log on and there's a, an amazing like talent 
mm-hmm. that I get to just chat with for like 15 minutes or whatever. Ready to like go. it's wild to me. Yeah, it's wild to me that this is this is my daily right now. It's great. How much work was it when you were doing both shows at once? Like what what, what type of day were we looking at in terms of a schedule? Um, quite a bit. You know, it's it's a it was weekly. So what they had done was I was with YTV one day a week because they had they had taken me off of the zone, which was the Monday to Friday show, but they kept me on Big Fun Movies, which was the Sunday show. So when I was at YTV, I was doing I was on air six days a week, right? So I was doing the wow. two shows. Um, and then there's a period of time when I was also doing the next star. So that was a mm-hmm. completely separate episodic uh, competitive show. So I was doing that as well. So that, even that was a lot. So again, For like sure. with this transition to this, it wasn't like the time I, that I was needed to work was a whole lot more than I was used to, or that the workload mm-hmm. was a whole lot more than I was used to. It just kind of shifted. So I would do Bigfoot movies on I think Wednesdays. And then the rest of the week was dedicated to ET Canada. Um, but my primary role when we're not in quarantine times is really as a traveling reporter. Right. So, I mean, I'll, I host the show in, or uh, co-host the show in studio with Cheryl or Roz or Sangita. Um, but primarily it would be, we need someone to go to LA. Can you go to New York? Can you go to Shanghai? Can you go wherever? And we're going to do, you know, whatever the assignment is there. Right. And so you imagine, you know, if it's five hours to LA, three days there, and then five hours back or whatever, like that's almost a full week already. For sure. Then on top of that is go back to ET and do, um, do the in-studio stuff and interviews and then go to ITV and then come. So wow. there were stretches of time where it's a lot, right? For like sure. where I'm just never here. Um, and then some stretches where I get to be here sort of like semi-normally, like sort of like, I guess like normal people get to be home. <laughs> right. What's that like with the family? Because you have two kids, um, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's been like, it's been the challenge, man. Hmm. Uh, the kids were used to it. They don't love it. Right. But, you know, it's, it's just like they understand, oh, daddy's got to go away tomorrow. He's going to be away for three days or four days, that kind of thing. Um, and I try not to do the thing where I get them a gift every single time because then they expect the gift every single time. And I can't, <laughs> Keeps I'm, like, going, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm gone every week, guys. I can't get you something every single, <laughs> so anyways, um, the thing was, the thing was more like my, my beautiful wife, us, us juggling our responsibilities in the house here with me right. being away. Like that's the thing that get, gets to be really challenging. And like, I guess in a way, lucky for us, the kids were so young that um, it's sort of, they were sort of able to understand that for us, like this is kind of the way that things are. Right. Um, but of course, quarantine and lockdown has changed that immensely. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, as awful as it all is, and, and um, um, you know, despite all the suffering a lot of people are going through, um, for us, us being able, like me being able to be home has been its own silver lining for sure. in this whole thing. Huge change it must be. Massive change. Yeah. Massive change. And I mean, you have to find some sort of positivity in your situation. I mean, I completely agree. It's, it's, it's horrible, the circumstances in which it's happened, but if you're able to either get more family time or get more time on your craft, I think that it's important to look at those silver linings because it's, it's close to all we have at the moment. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, we're doing the most we can like Rachel and I to spend time together, the four of us, um, because, you know, I, I mean, I personally don't know when this is ever going to happen again. We're going to have this kind of time with them again. Right. So I'm here now. They're, they're homeschooling, um, virtual schooling, I should say. So they're mm-hmm. like upstairs in their rooms right now in class. Nice. And so we do get to see each other every day. We have lunch together every day. We have dinner together every day, like seven days. We hang out on the weekends. My kids and I play video games together every day because we're all nerds in this house, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, That's perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, my father, she always jokes because she's like, oh my God, you're raising them just like you. Like they're, you're raising them to be just like you are. And I'm like, yes, it's working. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I certainly don't take it for granted that um, I have the opportunity to still work in, yeah. these, in this uh, environment, in this scenario, um, and also get to be with my family, which is something I have not had. Like, you know, you heard me say that I started work right after I started school, mm-hmm. you know, but when right I started, of, when of I started graduation. right out of college. Yeah. But even in college, like there was no, I didn't get summer breaks in college. Like we just wow. kind of went and went and went and got a couple of weeks off and went and went and went. So I don't, 
you know, this has been my first break where I've been able to take more than two weeks off in 16 or 17 years or something so when like you're that. Pretty much in most of your professional life or in your professional life. I beg your pardon? Like basically the first break in your professional life. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And remarkable. it's not even a break. It's not even a break, right? right? I'm right. still working. Not even like, a break, we, but just change of change of flow. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, yeah no, it, it is a super special thing. And I mean, the opportunities you're able to get, um, I'm sure you must miss the traveling. Uh, off the top of your head, um, what, what travel moments really stick out to you when I say ET Canada? Um, Shanghai, I mentioned mm -hmm. to you. I mean, I, L.A. Is, is a huge thing because I'm there all the yeah. time. Like, um, I have friends down there. I see them often. Uh, and there's sort of like a regular rhythm to what it's like being down there. Um, so that's kind of like, that's always number one, because that's like the main, that's the epicenter of everything. But I've taken, since my time here, I've taken like a number of really phenomenal trips to places that just like, going to Shanghai was, was insane. It was, it was wild. I got to go with a great crew of guys, um, well, two other guys anyways to go and report on uh, the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show that year. But even just getting into China was, was wild because I'd, I'd wanted to go since I was a kid hmm. um, and never really, I was, I was like, when am I ever going to go? Right. And, uh, and the opportunity to go for work. Like for me, I love traveling for work. So again, yeah. it, the, the gig fits me really well. I love being able to go to places, but also have a sort of like a direct purpose while I'm there. Sure. You know? Like there's you time, don't there's go. time to me enter. Yeah, I mean, there's time to meander and, and do fun things and see mm -hmm. sites and all that. But it's also nice to be able to say that I was there, I was doing something and we were really focused. I, I guess it's kind of like, in my mind, it's like you sort of earn your downtime by putting mm -hmm. in some really good work in the top. And then at the end, you can be like, okay, I really deserve this dinner. I really deserve this night out. I really deserve this whatever. So Shanghai was wild. It was a great one because it's just so out of sorts there. Um, I spent... I spent some time in Ireland. I got to do St. Patrick's Day in Ireland wow. um, with Mark Hamill. That's incredible. Holy. So that's like, I don't even Dream know. Dream come like, true. Like, like what? <laughs> like how? Was he right? drinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, they, had, they had made him like the, what's the, what's the term? Like the marshal or the captain or whatever of the mm. parade. And so we, uh, you know, a bunch of press got to be there and we did wow. this amazing trip there. And then, the one that was sort of a dream trip for me was um, uh, was going to Tokyo. I had gone mm -hmm. the year previous with my brother just to be like, let's just go. We've wanted to go our entire lives. Let's just take 10 days or whatever. And then the year after, they're like, hey, you want to go to Tokyo for Pokemon, Detective Pikachu or whatever? I was like, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'll go back. So it's things like that. Like those are the things that, you know, man, I feel just to sound cliche or whatever, but like I feel so blessed because again, it's like, I get to work, I get to travel. So I get to tick off those boxes of things I've been wanting to do. Um, yeah, it's great. Incredible. And it is, it's inspiring to me. I mean, again, seeing where something like this can take a person and, and, you know, doing it for work and doing something you love. I mean, that's, that's the goal. So, you know, that's just an incredible thing. Yeah. Um, well, you're doing that. Well, thank I you. I mean, like, it looks like you're, it looks like you're doing that. I went back and watched a bunch of your videos too. And I was like, I think the one, the farthest one I went back, you must have been 16 years old or something like that. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy. It's like, like getting in. Like, it's, it's fantastic. It's amazing, man. Oh, I can't thank you enough. That, that really means a lot to me. Uh, just real quick before we end it off, um, how and when did you end up in a cage with a 700-pound tiger? Yes. So <laughs> um, there used to be – I don't think it's active anymore – uh, there used to be a place called Bowmanville Zoo here mm -hmm. in Ontario. And to my understanding, um, the, the animals that uh, they used there were in a bunch of movies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. it turns out, however, um, this is just a side note, but it turns out that it was not a great place and they were not being treated well. And that's, so that's an awful, that, that's something that I didn't know, I guess at the time, because we would go, and we'd have, they'd be like, oh, you can hang out with these animals here. You can hang out with these animals there. And it wasn't until after this all happened mm. that animal experts that I talked to were like, that should never happen. Right. Um, but it was at that place where uh, 
they were like, if you want to, you can get in with this tiger and, you know, you can shoot the segment. You'll be safe because the trainer is there and whatever. And I was like, again, that like, like my attitude, like we discussed earlier on, like, it's a thing we can do. Let's I do guess it. let's just try it. Let's just do it. <laughs> and um, uh, like uh, our camera guy, I think, I, Humphrey, I think is his name. Um, God bless him. He did it. I know he didn't want to do it. I know he was like super, so scared to be in there. And we were all super nervous. And But it's like, it's funny when someone tells you, D don't be afraid. Like, don't be fearful of, of being in this cage with a 700 pound tiger. And it's like, <laughs> just think of it like a, like a big dog. Oh my like, gosh. This is wild. This is wild. But, um, but okay, we're doing it. And so, I mean, I mean, we just did it. it. And it's just one of those things where we're just like, oh, here's an opportunity for us to do this thing. Okay, let's do this thing. And I mean, after the fact, we were like, well, did we just do that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I can't believe you went in there and that just happened. Um, but it was one of those things where the opportunity presented itself and we're like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. And you pulled it off. That's it, man. I guess so. <laughs> I guess we did. Here I am, right? Incredible, man. It's, it's so crazy the things you've gone through, man. And uh, just while I have the opportunity, I appreciate you doing everything you've done. And, you know, I know you, you go, you speak, you give back a lot. Um, you try to help people out. So I appreciate everything you've done to just to show Canadians this is possible. This is incredible. So I thank you. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. And, you know, it's been, um, I feel very lucky. I feel very mm -hmm. lucky. And, you know, that um, along with that goes a lot of work for sure. Yeah. Um, but um, I feel very lucky to be presented with the opportunities to prove that I can do the work. No doubt. Carlos Bustamante, thank you so much. Hey, thanks, man. This is really great. And, and to you, man, I'm impressed. I'm looking forward to more things from you. And there you have it. My exclusive podcast with Carlos Bustamante from ET Canada and YTV's The Zone. I want to thank Carlos again and ET Canada for helping facilitate this. They're fantastic over there at what they do. Make sure to follow our guests on all of his social media. It is in the description below on this audio or video broadcast. Also, make sure to follow the show. Hit that subscribe button wherever you're currently consuming this content, be it Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Spotify. Follow the show on all social media, at Cassius Show. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And follow me on all social media, at Cassius Morris, Instagram, Cassius Morris underscore. Look forward to connecting with you guys there. Thanks so much for enjoying this milestone with me. It's been so much fun. Until next time, it's Cassius Morris saying, rock on.